Did Christianity enlighten the continent of Europe, or did it extinguish a vibrant tapestry of ancient beliefs? What if the conversion of Europe was a tale not of salvation, but of suppression? What secrets lie buried beneath centuries of history? What happened when ancient faiths clashed with a rising creed? Were Europe's pagans the last defenders of a rich, diverse heritage, or were they obstacles to the march of a unified faith? Now we will find out together how the pagans resisted Christianity. We will not only scratch on the surface, we will dive deep into the fascinating stories of these religious clashes. This is not just history, it's a story of survival, identity, and the unyielding power of belief. The Spread of Christianity In the first centuries AD, a new faith began to emerge from the shadows of the Roman Empire. Christianity, born in the humblest corners of Judea, was about to embark on an unprecedented journey across continents. The early Christians, often persecuted for their beliefs, found strength in their unity and fervor. Their message of salvation and eternal life began to resonate, attracting followers from every stratum of society. The turning point came with Emperor Constantine's conversion to Christianity. The Edict of Milan, proclaimed in 313 AD, granted Christians the freedom to practice their faith openly, setting the stage for an unparalleled spread of Christianity. The establishment of monastic communities played a crucial role in the spread of Christianity. Monasteries served as centers of learning, agriculture, and healthcare, making them attractive to the local populace. Missionaries from these communities, such as St. Patrick in Ireland and St. Boniface in Germanic territories, embarked on evangelization missions. They often adapted Christian teachings to local customs and traditions, facilitating conversions. The fall of the Western Roman Empire in the 5th century AD opened new avenues for the spread of Christianity. The migrating barbarian tribes, including the Goths, Vandals, and Franks, came into contact with Christian communities. The Franks, under King Clovis, became the first Germanic tribe to convert to Christianity en masse, setting a precedent for other tribes. Clovis's conversion was partly motivated by political and social benefits, highlighting the intertwined nature of religion and power. A key strategy in the spread of Christianity was the syncretization of pagan and Christian practices. Christian holidays were often aligned with pagan festivals, and many pagan temples were repurposed into churches. This approach not only made Christianity more accessible to the pagan populace, but also facilitated a smoother transition by preserving cultural and societal structures. The spread of Christianity across Europe was not as straightforward as it may sound. The resistance to the spread of Christianity among pagan communities in Europe was marked by a complex interplay of cultural, religious, and political factors. This resistance was not monolithic, but varied significantly across regions and periods. Before the onset of the Saxon Wars, the Saxons were a loosely organized society of pagans who practiced a form of Germanic paganism, worshiping deities such as Woden and Thor. Their society was organized into several tribes and lacked a centralized government, which made them both formidable in their resistance and vulnerable to a well-organized external force like Charlemagne's Frankish Empire. The conflict began in earnest in 772 when Charlemagne decided to invade Saxony, purportedly incensed by the Saxons' pagan practices and their periodic raids into Frankish territories. However, Charlemagne's motives were likely a mix of religious zeal, political strategy, and a desire to consolidate and expand his empire. The campaign opened with the destruction of the Irminsul, a sacred Saxon pillar that was a symbol of their religion and society signaling the Frankish intent to dismantle Saxon paganism systematically. One of the most infamous incidents of the Saxon Wars was the Massacre of Verdun in 782 AD, where, following a Saxon rebellion against Frankish rule and forced conversion to Christianity, Charlemagne ordered the execution of around 4,500 Saxon prisoners. This event is often cited as a grim example of the extreme measures taken by Charlemagne to secure his empire's Christianization and has been a point of contention among historians regarding its justification and morality. This event, however, did not quell the Saxon spirit, but rather inflamed further resistance. Their resistance was characterized by guerrilla warfare, surprise attacks, 
and strategic retreats into the dense forests of Saxony. The Saxons revolted multiple times, notably after the massacre of Verdun, demonstrating their staunch opposition to both Frankish domination and the Christian religion being forced upon them. Their strategy was to avoid open field battles where Charlemagne's cavalry could dominate, instead opting for ambushes, night attacks, and swift raids into Frankish territories. This form of resistance was highly effective in the early stages of the conflict, forcing Charlemagne to adapt his military strategies. The turning point in the Saxon Wars came when Widukind, the leader of the Saxon resistance, surrendered and accepted baptism in 785 AD, a symbolic gesture that significantly demoralized the Saxon resistance. Even after Widukind's surrender and baptism in 785 AD, pockets of resistance continued. Many Saxons viewed Widukin's conversion as a betrayal or a tactical move rather than genuine capitulation. Subsequent revolts were driven by local leaders, underscoring the decentralized nature of Saxon society and its resistance. Charlemagne's response to the Saxon resistance was multifaceted, combining military might with strategic policies intended to dismantle the pagan societal structure. The Capitulary of Saxony, 785 AD, this draconian decree made death the penalty for refusing to be baptized, practicing paganism, or even cremating the dead, a pagan practice. It aimed to eradicate Saxon paganism by legislating against its practices. Establishment of bishoprics. Charlemagne established bishoprics and monasteries throughout Saxony, not only to Christianize, but also to exert Frankish administrative control over the region. Fortifications and colonization. Charlemagne fortified key positions within Saxony and encouraged Frankish and Christian settlers to move into the area, diluting the local pagan population and ensuring loyalty to the Frankish crown. The official end of the Saxon Wars came in 804 AD, after several more decades of sporadic resistance and the gradual assimilation of the Saxons into the Carolingian Empire. The Saxons' forced conversion and integration marked a significant chapter in the Christianization of Europe. It also left a lasting legacy on Saxon society, transforming its religious, social, and political structures fundamentally. For the Saxons, resistance to Christianity was not merely about preserving pagan beliefs, but also about maintaining autonomy and cultural identity in the face of external domination. For Charlemagne and the Frankish Empire, the conquest and Christianization of Saxony were pivotal in the Carolingian consolidation of power and the expansion of Christianity in medieval Europe. Another remarkable conflict, and the resistance to Christianity in Europe was the following example. Norse paganism, the pre-Christian belief system of the Scandinavian peoples, and the Viking Age, roughly 793-1066 AD, are intimately linked to the narrative of resistance against the spread of Christianity in Europe. This period marked a dynamic intersection of cultures as Viking expeditions brought the Norse into contact with Christian lands across Europe, from the British Isles to the Mediterranean. Norse paganism was polytheistic, with a pantheon that included gods such as Odin, Thor, and Freya, among others. The religion was closely tied to agricultural cycles, maritime navigation, and warfare, reflecting the Vikings' way of life. Rituals and sacrifices were important for ensuring success in these endeavors, conducted by both local chieftains and specialized religious figures like seers and priestesses. The Viking Age began with the raid on the Lindisfarne Monastery in 793 AD a symbolic event often cited as the start of the Norse interaction with Christian Europe. While these raids were initially motivated by wealth, they increasingly led to sustained contact through trade, settlement, and political alliances. Vikings established themselves in Christian lands, such as Normandy in France, granted to Viking leader Rollo by the Frankish king Charles the Simple in 911 AD, and the Danelaw in England. Scandinavia's political landscape was characterized by a loose configuration of kingdoms and territories, each led by powerful chieftains and kings who wielded considerable autonomy. This decentralized structure meant that the decision of a ruler to adopt Christianity did not automatically translate into widespread conversion among the populace. The Norse society was built around a warrior ethos, valuing honor, bravery in battle, 
and loyalty to one's kin and chieftain. When rulers like King Harold Bluetooth of Denmark adopted Christianity, they often faced significant opposition from their subjects, who saw this as not only a religious, but also a cultural betrayal. Harold's conversion and subsequent efforts to Christianize Denmark were met with resistance, manifesting in uprisings that challenged his authority and the new faith. This resistance was not merely a rejection of Christian beliefs, but also a defense of traditional Norse identity and autonomy against perceived external influence. In Norway, the Christianization efforts of King Olaf Tryggvason and King Olaf II Haraldsson, St. Olaf, provide insight into the tumultuous nature of religious transformation. Olaf Tryggvason's aggressive approach to conversion, including the destruction of pagan temples and the erection of churches, provoked widespread discontent. His reign saw the forced baptism of Norse people, often under threat of violence or death, sparking revolts that sought to preserve pagan practices and resist the king's authority. King Olaf II, Haraldson's reign further exemplifies the challenges of Christianization. Despite being more successful in establishing Christianity, Olaf II's methods, which continued the use of force and coercion, led to his eventual martyrdom and temporary reversals in the Christianization process. His death in battle against pagan rebels and rival claimants to the throne underscored the deeply entrenched resistance to Christianity. However, Olaf II's martyrdom later became a pivotal element in consolidating Christianity in Norway, as he was venerated as a saint, and his legacy was used to foster a Christian identity among the Norse. The gradual acceptance of Christianity in some regions can be attributed to syncretism, the blending of Christian and pagan traditions. Missionaries and Christian leaders often incorporated Norse symbols, rituals and holidays into the Christian practice, making the new religion more palatable to the Norse people. This strategy of integration, rather than outright replacement, facilitated a smoother transition in some areas, though it did not eliminate resistance. By the end of the Viking Age, most of Scandinavia had nominally converted to Christianity, a process that significantly transformed Norse society. The resistance to Christianity had profound effects, shaping the nature of Scandinavian Christianity, which retained elements of pagan tradition well into the medieval period. The sagas and archaeological evidence from this period reflect a society in transition, where pagan and Christian symbols coexisted, and old beliefs were reinterpreted within a new religious framework. Another important milestone to Christianity in Europe were the Baltic Crusades in the 12th and 13th centuries. Unlike the better-known Crusades in the Holy Land, the Baltic Crusades aimed to convert the pagan peoples of the Baltic Sea region to Christianity through a combination of military conquest and missionary work. This endeavor involved a range of actors, including the Holy Roman Empire, Scandinavian kingdoms, and the papacy against a backdrop of indigenous tribes such as the Prussians, Livonians, Estonians, and Lithuanians. The initiation of the Baltic Crusades can be traced back to the late 11th century, with increased interest from Christian Europe to bring the pagan peoples of the Baltic region into the Christian fold. This interest was partly religious, driven by a desire to expand Christendom, and partly political, as European powers sought to control trade routes and resources in the Baltic. The formal launch of crusading efforts in the Baltic is often associated with Pope Celestine III's call in 1193, which was further reinforced by subsequent papal bulls. The Prussian Crusades, a series of campaigns against the Prussians, who resisted the Christianization efforts fiercely. The Teutonic Knights led these efforts, eventually subjugating the Prussian tribes and integrating their territories into the Teutonic Order's state by the late 13th century. The Teutonic Knights was a German military order founded in the late 12th century. The Livonian Crusade Aimed at converting the Livonian and Estonian tribes, this crusade saw the establishment of Riga and the spread of Christianity through Livonia. It involved a complex series of military campaigns and negotiations, often pitting the crusaders against not only pagan tribes but also Christian rulers in Scandinavia and Russia who had their interests in the region. The Lithuanian Wars Lithuania was the last pagan region in Europe to face crusading efforts. 
the Lithuanians mounted a formidable resistance under leaders like Mindaugas and Vytautas the Great, maintaining their pagan identity until the end of the 14th century when they officially converted to Christianity, largely through political marriages and alliances, rather than military conquest. The integration of Baltic territories into the Western Christian sphere led to the introduction of feudal systems, German colonization, and the assimilation of local elites into the broader European nobility. Despite the widespread conversion to Christianity, elements of Baltic paganism persisted, influencing local customs and traditions. The Crusades also sparked long-lasting resistance and resentment among the Baltic peoples towards foreign domination. The establishment of the Teutonic Order and the Christianization of the Baltic region reshaped the geopolitical landscape, setting the stage for future conflicts in Northern and Eastern Europe, particularly with the rising power of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania and the Kingdom of Poland. The Baltic Crusades thus represent a pivotal episode in the medieval history of Europe, marking the violent intersection of faith, power, and culture at the northeastern frontier of Christendom. The defeat of the Slavic resistance was another significant milestone to the Christianization of Europe. The Christianization of the Eastern Slavs, particularly the Kievan Rus, began in earnest with the baptism of Grand Prince Vladimir in 988 AD. Vladimir's conversion, following his marriage to the Byzantine Princess Anna, marked a turning point, leading to the official adoption of Byzantine Christianity as the state religion. Resistance took various forms, from passive non-compliance and the continuation of pagan practices in private to active rebellion against Christian authorities. Chronicles from the period recount instances of idols being secretly worshipped and pagan rites being conducted in defiance of the new Christian norms. The Western Slavs, including the Palabian Slavs and the Sorbs, experienced a more tumultuous path to Christianization, marked by military campaigns and forced conversions. The Germanic push eastward, known as the push to the east, brought the Western Slavs into direct conflict with the expanding Holy Roman Empire and its Christian mission. Resistance among the Western Slavs was characterized by uprisings against German settlers and military incursions, the destruction of Christian churches, and the reassertion of pagan practices. Over several centuries, through a combination of military subjugation, political pressure, and cultural assimilation, the Western Slavs were gradually Christianized, though elements of their pagan heritage persisted in folklore and local customs. The legacy of paganism in Europe, despite centuries of Christian dominance, is a testament to the enduring influence of pre-Christian beliefs, practices, and cultural identities. One of the most notable aspects of the pagan legacy is the syncretism observed in Christian practices. Early Christian missionaries often adopted a pragmatic approach to conversion, integrating rather than eradicating existing pagan customs and festivals. This strategy facilitated the acceptance of Christianity, but also ensured the survival of pagan traditions in altered forms. For instance, many Christian holidays coincide with earlier pagan festivals, Easter aligns with celebrations of spring renewal, while Christmas incorporates numerous elements of the Roman Saturnalia and the Germanic Yule celebrations. Pagan myths and stories have profoundly influenced European literature and languages. Many modern European languages contain words and place names of pagan origin, reflecting the deep integration of these ancient cultures into the fabric of European identity. The revival of interest in pagan mythology during the Renaissance and later periods led to the incorporation of these ancient narratives into the works of poets, playwrights, and authors, enriching European literature with a wealth of mythological motifs and themes. Pagan symbols, such as the Celtic cross, the Norse Valknut, and various Slavic motifs, continue to be used in art, jewelry, and tattoos, reflecting a fascination with and respect for these ancient cultures. These symbols often carry meanings related to nature, the cycle of life, and the connection between the physical and spiritual worlds, offering a window into the worldview of Europe's pre-Christian inhabitants. Many contemporary European festivals have roots in pagan traditions, celebrating seasonal cycles, fertility, and the harvest. These include the May Day celebrations, which have origins in the Celtic Beltane and the Germanic Walpurgis Night and the Midsummer festivities, which are particularly prominent in the Nordic countries. 
These celebrations often feature elements like bonfires, dancing, and the wearing of traditional costumes, echoing ancient rites of passage and cycles of nature. As we move forward, let us carry with us the understanding that history is not merely a series of events that have passed, but a living, breathing presence that shapes our present and future. If you enjoyed the video, please like, share, and subscribe. Thank you for joining us on this journey through time, across the green fields and the dense forests of the Saxons and the rugged landscapes of the Norse. Until our next adventure into the past.